Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage State Representative Sherry Gay Dangyago. <laughs> she is a hot mama. <laughs> I remember my first day of kindergarten. I was so excited. I've been left home all my life by my two brothers and my sister as they went to school. This was an exciting day. I remember putting on my new outfit, my stride right shoes, <laughs> the kind with the hard bottoms. I ran downstairs with so much excitement only to hear my mother say, girl, where you going with that makeup on? <laughs> I thought to myself, surely she must be joking. <laughs> it's what I saw her do all the time. Get done up for very big days. And kindergarten? <laughs> was a very big day. I remember Roosevelt had such a welcoming environment. Yes, Detroit Public Schools. I had a beautiful teacher. She was tall, she was white, but she was nice. I remember the hard wooden floors and we used to say a pledge of allegiance and we'd even say prayer. Yes. It was such a beautiful, welcoming environment. I don't remember though, if my mother made me take my makeup off <laughs> or she took it off. I just remember her reaction. Growing up in my household, being raised by a single mother, the youngest of three siblings, was never, ever a dull moment. We had cousins and friends, co-workers from Ford Motor Company that would come over all the time and they would celebrate birthdays, holidays, funerals, you name it, some kind of celebration was going on on Burlingame and Dexter. We lived in a big brick house. We had cars. You know, everything I thought that we could imagine, we had. We lived across the street from the wheelers, down the street from the wheelers, and across the street from the stringers. One of the stringers' son, my sister had, my niece by. Yes, and so I remember having family and friends that would sometimes come to live with us. We had cousins that my mother took care of and friends that came by. As a matter of fact, we had a friend of the family named Lula that came to live with us and, and my mother worked a lot and so being at the factory and one day she came home and she asked Lula, how was everything? How, how was Sherry today? And she said, oh Ruth, everything was fine, fine. Lula kind of stuttered a little bit. And she said, yeah, she said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I fed her some, some, some of this food. She said, what did you feed her? She, she told her what she fed me. She said, girl, I was dog food. <laughs> I don't remember what it tastes like. <laughs> but obviously, it didn't kill me. <laughs> My mother also is a seamstress. She learned to sew from her mother, Julia. And it's also the work that she did in the factory. It's also where she met my father. In the factory, they had to have a quota. It would make car seats, and I hear them talking about that as I got older. But my father hooked up with my mother by telling her that he could help her get her production up. 
That was the smoothest game ever. And I guess he did, because they produced me. <laughs> you know what, growing up in my household, being the youngest, my brothers and sisters thought I got away with murder. And I was often the center of attention. I remember my fifth birthday. Oh, we was in that big dining room, standing at that big oval wooden table. I was standing on the chair I had on my long cotton pink dress with my white pant leather shoes and my ankle socks with ribbons in my hair. I remember everybody was looking at me. <laughs> or maybe it was that crystal punch bowl with the ladder in the center of the table. Maybe it was the Sanders cake or the ice cream, hot dogs, and chips. The room was decorated, balloons clinging to the wall after my brothers and cousins had rubbed them on the clothes to keep that static clean. We didn't use scotch tape back then. But it was the best celebration ever. As they were singing happy birthday, I remember making a wish and everybody was watching. Soon that little girl would hear this dream. My mother always had these dreams and premonitions. She, she dreamed, she even dreamed about my, daughter, my sister being pregnant. But that's a whole nother story. At 16. But she would tell this dream about her mother's death. She actually dreamed her mother's death the way that it would happen. She would be on the phone with the long cord attached to the kitchen wall, all tangled up. For those 20 and below, that's when we had landlines. They were plugged into the wall. <laughs> yeah, girl, I actually dreamed my mother's death. Yeah, uh-huh. I, I, it's clear as day. I dreamed exactly the way it happened. And in a dream, I called my friend Isaac. You know Isaac that drank those beers, the, the, the gator, the gator, the gator beers. Popping gators. <laughs> that Sherry sneaks sometimes. I called him in the dream, and in the dream, Isaac died too. And years later, my mother would actually live her dream. Her mother was in a car accident on I believe I-75 at a 375 interchange. And when the accident occurred, she actually picked up the phone to call Isaac. And Isaac was on his way from what I could remember in the call. And Isaac called her back and told her, Ruth, I remember that dream. I'm sorry, I'm not coming. She would also tell a dream about how God let her know that she would have a baby girl that would replace her mother. And being the youngest, I was that baby girl. Hearing that dream over and over and over again. After a while, I start to believe that I was, in fact, Julia reincarnated. My older cousin, May, every time she would get her brown paper bag, she'd say, girl! Me and your grandma was some spokes. <laughs> Ooh, girl. Everybody loved Julia. Girl, you look just like her. Your legs just like her. She had a gap in her teeth just like her. Girl. And anybody know Aunt May know that you didn't interrupt her because she cussed, cursed, cussed. <laughs> her 
sister's in-law's family out at her husband's funeral. So everybody know that you didn't interrupt <laughs> Aunt May, brown bag or not. <laughs> After a while hearing the story of my older cousin from Jacksonville, Florida, Merck says, ooh, I just miss Julia. And you look just like Julia. Hearing that and hearing that Julia was this woman who, who built the house from the ground, who, who built the hotel from the ground, who was the first one in our family to buy a Cadillac. Hearing that Julia was this smart businesswoman. Although I enjoyed the privilege of the older cousins and those that refer to me as Julia, those were some pretty big shoes to fill. I wasn't asked to take on the responsibility of Julia, but at that age, I felt compelled to exemplify Julia. And so as years would go, I didn't want to fail at anything that I did. I had to uphold the image of who Julia was. I never got to meet Julia. I became Julia. And so, even with this privilege that my brothers and sisters thought that I had, there was a burden of responsibility that came from being my mother's mother. I had to be the last one at home when they all moved out. I had to be the one that went every Sunday to the quartet singing groups with her on Elmwood and Art. I had to be the one that she made a dress like she made uh, the women in the group long polyester yellow with a tie around the neck. I was singing a solo with this group at seven years old. And one of the women had a beard, so I knew they had to be 40 or 50 or higher. <laughs> if you know any... <laughs> if you know anything about quartet groups, we would be singing, and I would be crying. They'd be singing, I be holding my ear and crying. I said, damn, can they hear? <laughs> so often, they were so off key. <laughs> but that was my fate. And I didn't want to disappoint my mother. After all, I was a woman. And women weren't supposed to cry. Not even if they missed hopscotch. Mr. Fox, Mr. Fox, or Tag. Women weren't even supposed to cry if they missed their fathers. I remember one day, my mother came home to find me sitting in the dark, crying uncontrollably. Oh, I was crying. I was crying because I actually did miss my father. I didn't want her to know. I was her mother. I didn't want her to think that she wasn't doing everything that she could. So I tried to hold it together until I couldn't hold it anymore. Oh no, I cried. I cried and I cried. She called the church to tell Elder Graham <laughs> to pray for me. Cause she thought I was having a breakdown. <laughs> you just have to know my mother. <laughs> but the truth is, I wasn't having a breakdown. I was so afraid of failing. Afraid of failing at being Julia afraid of failing at being a woman. I had to spend a lot of time with my mother, and, and I shouldn't say had, because I enjoyed the closeness that we had. But there was a bond that was sometimes endearing, but sometimes overbearing. So much so that after going to SUMI College in Hancock, Michigan, 
I decided that I, I was going to New York. I was moving to New York. After all, I spent a lot of time there growing up as a child. And that's where Aunt May is, or where Aunt May was. I went to New York on one of our several trips because I used to fly there all the time, even as a child, and get my wings because I flew alone. But this time I was old enough, I thought, to make my own decisions. And so I called back home and I told, asked my mother, I said, Ma, if I, if I find a job tomorrow, can I stay? She said, sure. I was raised to be saved, sanctified, and committed to church. But she didn't know just how bad I wanted to stay. That next morning, I got on a number two train and I hit it to Manhattan. I went to office after office. I went to temp services, you name it. But at the end of that day, I was working at Guyer McAllister Publications. <laughs> Hello. I called home and I said, Ma, I got a job. <laughs> she didn't sound too excited. So I stayed, and I stayed with my cousins. But even though I stayed, I know I broke her heart, breaking that time away, staying in New York for almost five and a half years. I enjoyed every bit of it. No more quartet singing groups. No more long polyester dresses. Baby, some of them say I'm in love with hip hop. I became hip-hop. <laughs> I hung as hard as I could. I partied as hard as I could. Heavy D, Biz Marquis. We was out there in Manhattan, in Harlem, living it up. But I finally came to myself. I remember all those prayers that my mother continued to pray. I remember her telling me to, you had dreams, you had goals, you had, and I didn't really want to hear that. But I finally came to myself and I came home. When I came home, I not only pulled it together for myself, but I had an opportunity to even years later to get my mother in school at Wayne County Community College, where she would get her associates at 75 years old. And it wasn't easy. Me and my mother both were also in this ministerial class together. And I was taking a class for both of us. <laughs> I was in a ministerial class cussing up a storm. <laughs> because I was mad every day that I had to write my paper. First of all, I didn't want to take the ministerial class. But now to take it with my mother after five years of being hip hop. <laughs> oh, I was like, Jesus, help me. And she just expected me to do her papers. <laughs> but that's okay. But if I thought helping my mother in school was hard, Oh my Jesus, my son Jordan, that just turned 24 and exemplifies the essence of a Taurus. That would be challenging. Being pregnant with Jordan, I had what they call hyperemesis gravidarum. I had to go home with a pick line in my arm. In the hospital, I had it in my neck. I was in there constantly because I couldn't keep anything down. So much so that this nurse one day told me, she pulled the curtain, she said, baby, you tried. Why don't you just give it up? Nobody would think lesser of you for it. That was a time when Kevorkian was around. And I said, no, I want you to get out of my room. I'm going to keep my child. I named him even while I was in the hospital. And so this constant going into the hospital for dehydration because of hyperemesis gravidarum continued to dry heave and throw up everything, even water, constantly. By the time it was time for him to go to kindergarten, 
I cried like a baby to leave him there. Every teacher, every principal to this day still knows who I am. <laughs> I planned the kindergarten graduation down at the Science Center. I planned the next graduation over at Renaissance High School. I was on the parent committee. I was there every time you turn around. I finally got my teaching certification. <laughs> and so I believe that's where a lot of my passion for education and our children resonates from. Fighting for my child, having to fight for all of our children. So taking Jordan to college was an adventure. <laughs> My niece and I driving down with another parent that was in the marching band at Cass Tech, second to none. <laughs> we go to South Carolina State, and after about four or five days, me and my niece Janita realize there's no more parents here. <laughs> Every day I found a reason to go find a refrigerator, a stove, a, a mop, an uh, 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 ironing board, I had to keep finding reasons to stay. <laughs> and when we left on that very long ride to come home, I was worried all the while. Seeing myself now as a parent and now becoming a legislator, reflecting on Jordan in college, his K through 12 experience, and then him coming home not completing college. I felt like a failure. I'm an educator. I'm a legislator, for God's sake. Surely, I could get my son across the finish line. But I realized that history has a way of repeating itself. And just as my mother couldn't contain me here, I can't harness and contain who he will become as a young man. I learned also that through our fear and even our failures, we gain strength. I understand that through our faith, everything that was poured into me, I've poured into him and it's given him a foundation. I realized that in our trust, in our faith, in our prayer and expectations, there's no way to prevent failure. We embrace it. I also learned that what we view as failure is not failure at all. It's an opportunity. Because behind every fear, there is a hope. There is a dream. And the foundation that was placed and formed before the foundation of the world is with me, in me, and it's in, with, it's in within him. And so learning to let go is what I've learned as a parent. I've learned to learn my mother despite imperfections. Grace that I hope that will be extended to me because I failed. I failed at marriage. I failed at diets. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> I failed my first race running for the legislature, but I gained so much more. I gained the depth of my roots and my strength. As a science teacher, I realize that the height of a tree is as only as deep as its roots. Those roots are strengthened through our failures, through our disappointments, yet our perseverance. I know with full confidence that my son, Jordan Ahmad Danyogo, 
is predestined to be great and to have greatness because it's already deeply rooted within him. That's my story. State Representative Sherry Gay Danyogo.